people at Wembley than ever before. They've jammed in a few more seats to bring it up to 100,000. And the King is here to greet the teams in the match that's supposed to be over before it starts. The experts are calling Wolverhampton Wanderers this year's wonder team. And apparently the only thing the experts are interested in now is by how many goals the Wolves are going to win. But it doesn't take the 100,000 long to find out how wrong the experts can be. Football is a wonderful game. The Queen is here too. To see Portsmouth in white shorts and the Wolves in the dark. And Guthrie wins the toss for Pompey. No score for the first 31 minutes. Then Morgan of Portsmouth kicks the long ball down the field to Anderson. Anderson to Barlow, who left the Wolves only two months ago. And Barlow turns the tables on his old team. To put Portsmouth one up. One minute from half time and another Portsmouth onslaught. The ball swings over from the right and runs loose to Anderson. Anderson puts it just wide of Scott's right hand and makes it two up at half time. The second half opens with sensation. Anderson kicks off and within 30 seconds, Barlow drives for the Wolves' goal. Scott saves, but Parker rushes in to make it three for Pompey. And here comes the magnificent Wolves movement as Burton runs in and Dorset sends over a superb cross shot to make it 3-1. That odd goal brings the crowd to its toes for some of the finest football ever seen at Wembley in a cup final. But Scott can't hold off the mass attack forever and Pompey gets yet another. So the end comes with Portsmouth the cup winners by four goals to one. They got to the final ten years ago and were beaten. All right, pal, we know how many beans make four. They got to the final five years ago and were beaten again. But the third time, well, you know the rest, as Guthrie comes up for the happiest moment of his life. We all know that the Navy is Britain's sure shield, but the sailors won't be on the water tonight. My name's John Anthony, Portsmouth Football Club Westwood, I'm 50 years old um, and I'm an antiquarian bookseller. I'm lucky to have two passions in my life. I've got, obviously my football's my own passion, that's my life, that's what I live for. But the books don't come far off it. I grew up, my father started the business in 58 and I've grown up with books all my life. And I started on the picture famous side with um, a chap called Les he's like a second father to me. And uh, then I got on the book side with my father learned a lot about, did all the dog's body work, all that sort of thing. The customers are so nice, even the trade's so nice, it's old fashioned, it's still got certain rules and regulations. And it's great because being in a bookshop, it's quiet, it's sedate and it's nice. Obviously it's got its stresses and strains that any job has. In the trade you've got to say yes sir, no sir, please sir, three bags full sir. The customer's always right, that's what my father always said. And however, you've got to grit your teeth sometimes, but on a Saturday afternoon you can let all those frustrations out on the opposing team. I was a, a follower of Leeds, I wasn't really into football, but Leeds were the team at the time. I used to watch them when they were on match of the day now and again. And uh, Scummers were in the FA Cup in 76. And uh, they were taking the mickey out of my mate John Power at school, and they were Leeds, Man United, and all these sorts of sports. I thought, well, that's, it. that's my local side. And he's my mate. And uh, it was nothing to do with success or anything like that, but it was just the fact it was my local football club. So I bought the scars, bought the app, and I went to see Pompey on Boxing Day 76. And anyway, by then I was, I was hooked, and I wanted to get there and see them. I was, you know, I was looking out for all the results, went down Boxing Day with a crowd of 32,000. We'd been getting crowds of 10,000, we were in the third division. And it was like, I was just smitten. I knew from that moment, as I walked in that ground, I wanted this for the rest of my life, the passion, everything about it. It was a working class game. The ground was full of geezers, skinheads, it was a bit a bit scary, all this type of stuff, it was great. So basically, to me, more it was for the atmosphere more than the football at the time. And, uh, but no, it was just something about Pompey, a special club. O'Hara again coming out with the ball. It's another Portsmouth counter-attack, and it's Bell Hatch on the move again. And it's four against three here momentarily. Bell Hatch with the cross, a wish to obey. O'Hara, four for Portsmouth! Jamie O'Hara! They can hardly believe it! It has been an unbelievable week for Portsmouth!
Portsmouth one way and another, but it has just gone into the realms of fantasy in their wildest dreams. They couldn't have hoped to score four here today. No yeah, different breed of football fan. Um, Pomp is a working class city. What you see is what you get. You've got the dockyard and you've got the football club, and it's the football club that makes them tick. It's the only city in this country on an island, and we're not even English, we're just Pompey. Um, but it, it's bizarre because I've been to lots of other clubs throughout the land following Pompey and you speak to the locals who don't follow the game. And they'll say, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't walk across the road to see that lot. But you speak to anyone in Pompey, but they've all got an affinity with it. And they'll say, oh, we look out for the results and all this sort of stuff. But Pompey is, it's a boys club and all. It's a boys club, it's a proper club. And that's where the passion comes from. I mean, uh, all that came from the the 70s and the 60s, 70s and 80s when all the scrapping used to go on. You had to go around in gangs and you had to be tight, you had to be tight as a unit, you had to watch out each other's backs and all that sort of stuff. But that made, it was a badge of honour, you supported your club and you went through all that support your club and that's what created the passion, that's what created the bond between the fans and the club at that time and that's something that will never be replicated in the future because they think it's just about winning and losing, they don't understand it's more than that. I live and breathe the club and I see them out on the pitch and the whole thing of the, the fans, the passion, the team, the ground, the day out and the second family, because it is like having a second family, all my mates, I'm, so I've been going to football some 30 odd years, I see them more than I do in my own family and you know, all these other people you meet from all around the country and it is a second family and it's a recession because I'm obsessed by it, <laughs> so I, I love it, I, mean, I can't get enough of it. I just, I just love it, and it's. Uh, but when I say it's an obsession, I don't even think about going to football. I don't even think, like a lot of people, plan their season. I just know I'm going to go. I'm going to go, so I'm obsessed. But it's the passion side that does it for me, because life's all about passion, and it's you live for the moment, because the life, life is very short. It's like glass. One minute you're alive, one minute you're dead. So you've got to make the most of it while you're alive. And that's what I love about football, because it's, it's quick, it's passionate, and it's in your face, and it's better than any drug on earth. Hat in the week, it all came out bizarrely. Someone gave me the hat when we were playing Chelsea in the cup, and then an ex girlfriend bought me the wig at Christmas. And then a mate's mum made me the, the waistcoat, and I'm in a boozer one day. And my mate said, Get in with the chef's trousers, so I put them on. And then I put them in the shorts because I had my tattoos done. I thought there's no point having pompy tattoos, not showing them off. And then the kids all said I look like a clown, so I bought the boots. And it just happened over the course of a few years. Believe it or not, even though I wear all that stuff, I'm actually quite a shy, introvert person. I'm not. But obviously that's now where I've been doing it for so long, it's just, I put the hat and the wig on it, it's like a button switches in my head. And it's just bizarre, it's, it, but it's great, because even that other side of me, even though it's mad and that, it's not nasty or nothing like that, maybe a bit stupid. But um, it's, it's like the schoolboy inside me, and I don't want to grow up. And it's great, Saturday's afternoons is my chance to be young and free and whatever, forget all about the stresses and strains, get hammered with my mates, watch the football. And uh, whereas you've got to be so professional during the week that it complements each other. But no, at the end of the day, I can understand everyone's perception of me. I mean, if I looked at myself, I'd think, what a complete burk. Some people would think I look like a bit of a thug and all that sort of stuff. But you don't go around looking like that and expect everyone to want to like you. It's just um, nobody likes the same things, do they? Myself, I'm just a fan, the same as everyone else. When I've got all that gear on, I forget I've got it on. I just. I really forget I've got it on because I've been doing it so often. And I'm just a Pompey fan, I'm no different from anyone else. And uh, yeah, I may look different to everyone else and people may think, oh, he thinks he's something. I don't, I'm just a football fan who loves his football. And like I was saying, I just show it in a different way. It's caused me loads of troubles over the years, if I'm honest. I mean, from getting nicked at football, and I haven't gone to cause trouble, but I've, obviously I've been nicked at football. In the early days, it used to kick off all the time, and of course they'd pick off the people on the fringes because they didn't want to get hit by one of the loonies causing all the trouble, and it used to kick off big time all the time. I've been nicked, been a court, so obviously that's impacted on my finances, my relationships, my job here, how embarrassing, it's been in the papers, so it's affected the shop. And then subsequently, obviously, I've had relationships with girls, my missus, for a start. A month before I married her, I said, you sure you want to marry me? Because you married me, you married Pompey Football Club. She said, yeah, but then when it came to it, it was all 
where are you? I said, I'm a football, then it came to wanting kids, that I'd never wanted kids because um, of my lifestyle. But she said, football will be your thing, the kids will be my thing. I said, fair enough. No, obviously, I didn't mind changing nappies and all that during the week, but I wouldn't be there on the Saturdays. And then it was, where are you on? Anyway, to cut a long story short, she thought I was going to change. So it cost me a marriage and all that sort of stuff. And other women I've been, straight away I've told them I'm with what I am, they know what I'm like, but they can't handle it. So, but that's not going to change. And there's been times when I've gone to football and had me a kick team because of who I am and all this sort of stuff. Bottle, glass, whatever, it, it happens. So the wig and the and all that's caused me more trouble than anything else, if I'm honest. Been attacked, been nicked, had trouble with stewards, everything, blah, 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 blah. But um, if you want to do something in life, you don't stop it just because things happen. You're back uh, with Bloomberg. My name's Richard Salamath and you're watching Countdown. Uh, Countdown, not just about the European market open today because uh, we're also counting you down to a first for English football. Uh, Portsmouth in the process of becoming the first Premier League club to go into administration after four undisclosed buyers failed to prove that they had the funds to buy the club by yesterday afternoon's deadline. The South Coast Club has debts of more than £60 million. This includes £12 million owed to tax authorities but it needs to find £22 million before the end of the season in order to save it. Well, obviously the low points, it's all been the administration and the, um, the lowest point was when you, you're in the high court thinking you might not have a bloody club to watch. It's like watching your grandfather on a life support machine. And uh, you think, Jesus Christ, what actually happens if I wake up the morning and there's no football club, what would I do? Yeah, the, the, there might be a Phoenix club set up, which obviously I'd support to represent Pompey, but it, it wouldn't be the same, but all the ties would be cut. So it, if your grandfather dies, you can't go out and get a new grandfather. And to me, the, all the things we've done as a name of Pompey, and it, I, that was the lowest. I mean, I, I, I can't describe how I felt when you, you think the very existence of the club is on the line. And you think all the fun I've had, all the enjoyment I've had over the years, and my kids and my grandkids, my friends' kids and grandkids, that'd be denied to them. Something as basic as watching a football team. There's only one man to blame, that's Sasha Gader, mate. When he came in, he said all the money was his own. He said he was rich in his own right, nothing to do with his father. But as soon as his father, Gader Max, assets got frozen, he stopped putting the money in. So obviously it was his father's. He told his complete lies. And that's the trouble when you're owned by one man. I mean, it could happen to Man United, it could happen to Liverpool, it could happen to any of them. If their benefactor suddenly pulled the plug, they'd be stuffed. But they're more likely to be bought because of the stature in the game. Everyone says we're 60 million pounds in debt, we might have to go into administration. So we sell 90 million pounds worth of players and the debt rises to 130 million. I don't know how that works out. There was, there was obviously crooked things off money being siphoned and the whole circus that followed it with all the different ownerships and all these um, different owners didn't care what it meant to the fans and that's what really hurts. Um, and it was embarrassing when you, got, you haven't got the small creditors being paid, you've got bloody charities not being paid. As a Pompey fan, because you're proud of your club, that really hurts, it really makes you embarrassed. And uh, it's disgusting. But that's, that's football in the Premiership, it's all about money. They don't, they don't care about the man in the street. It's all about corporate, it's all about money, and it's all about players and managers, nothing to do with the fans. Bums on seats don't even make a dent in their finances. But out of that, badness, hopefully now Pompey can become a beacon of what's good in football because now we've found out we can actually be a blueprint for lots of other clubs around the country who are, going to, who are obviously going to go down our path because there's loads of them on the brink like us. So we can actually be good and that we can turn the bad into good. And it'd be great to see lots of clubs owned by their fans back to the days when local businessmen used to own the club and did the right things for the fans. And then in the lower league, bums on seats means a lot so they have to treat the customers better. But no, I feel I, I'm really excited by the whole thing, and I'm, I'm really excited that Pompey can be. There's any other club like Pompey could have done this, and, and it, it, but to see the development, to see how far it can go, and and to, to, to be a beacon for other clubs to follow, I think it's fantastic. And it's um, it's about the fans, it's about the city, it's a proper community club. It's a lot to be excited about. Impossible to Fantasy Island, a genuine tale of the unexpected. 
By no stretch of the imagination was this the anticipated finale. Back in January when English football's finest embarked on the long and winding road to Wembley. But now that it's at last upon us, it seems somehow to capture so perfectly the flavour, the very essence of this extraordinary FA Cup campaign of dash and daring from David and bloody nose for Goliath. This attack and Diara waiting on the edge of the area too, making it five. And then come on. And it's put in. Scratchy start, and he's been punished here. It's Kanu, the scorer in the semi final, who's the scorer in the final. And Portsmouth have won the FA Cup for the first time since 1939. And Harry Redknapp has led them into Europe for the first time. Chimes been heard louder in recent years. Amazing day, if I'm honest. The game wasn't a great game, but that didn't matter. It was the enormity of what we'd done. We'd won a domestic final. Uh, I never thought I'd see it. The whole day was bizarre. It just it went by in a flash. What really struck me is when I realised there was a cup final. It was when the abide with me come on, and. Uh, I suddenly thought, little I pine, I burst out crying. So I thought, bloody hell, we're in the cup final. This bombed me in the cup final. I waited all my bloody life for this. Every year I've watched the cup final and seen it and watched it and thought, God, I wish, wish that could be pumping. We're there. The game's going, we've just gone mental. It's a new score, and I just don't remember. We've just gone absolutely bonkers. I couldn't believe it. I thought my head was going to explode. And then obviously the, the cup being presented and all that, it's a blur, if I'm honest. To be perfectly honest, it just went so quick. It was just. I, I, I couldn't take it all in, my mind was just racing, it was just brilliant. I was trying to take it in, but I'm a moments man, I'm there for the moment. I'm never very good at recalling what happened. But the strangest thing was after the game, we all got on a minibus and we sat in there for about an hour, it's really subdued. I'm thinking, everyone's just sitting there thinking, Pompey has just won the FA Cup. What? What? This can't be right. It's just like, couldn't quite. Couldn't quite register, it was surreal. It was really bizarre. We come out, waited all our lives, and we sat there, and his geezers are at my age were sitting. Is this really happening? Are we having a dream or what? We won the FA Cup, and then we got back to Petersfield for about seven o'clock. And I had my tattoo done about 10 o'clock for the FA Cup final, put another cup in it, and then we were down by the parade for 11. To see 200,000 people on, in Pompey when the population's only 170,000 or 180,000, incredible. It just, that, that day, was, it was just unbelievable, the whole thing. And I still didn't take it in then. Even on the Monday, when I'm sobering up, it's like, we won the FA Cup. And it didn't really kick in until later in that week. But that day was just mesmerising, it was like, what you live for.